Okay, uh, welcome everyone um, to the Worship Ministry course. I trust you all are doing well, and I hope you've been learning something from the course. Um, just to do a quick recap of uh, what we've covered so far. Um, we've, we started from the life of Abraham, um, studied about how he was the man of altars and what God expects of us. Uh, and then we very briefly saw about how uh, worship was organized uh, in the Temple of Solomon uh, and prior to the exile and also how worship was organized uh, after the exile and then very briefly saw how worship was organized in the New Testament times in synagogues and uh, uh, and what the Psalms have to teach us about worship right um, so with that covered, I want us to go back to the Old Testament a little bit and thought we could just um, uh, take a not too deep a look, but in a slightly deeper look at the Tabernacle of Moses and how it was organized and why it's crucial uh, for all of us to understand um, the importance and the significance of it and also the importance of the Tabernacle back in their time, right? So uh, can we go ahead? Yeah. All right, um, but oh, it, what are some things that you can uh, share about the Tabernacle of Moses? And what are some other things that you know um, that kind of stands out to you, that has stood out to you if you've studied about it before? Uh, anyone in this? Yes, Charles, please go ahead. Oh, thank you so much, uh, Pastor. Um, about the tabernacle, are you are you observe that worship in form of sacrifice was very crucial and it was organized. Everyone knew what to do for each particular sacrifice as they worshipped God because they knew that they could not access God. The Shekinah glory of the Shekinah glory of God could not come down if there was anything in in around the area. So they had to first glimpse themselves, and then the Shekinah glory would appear when there is no sin in the camp. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Charles. Yes. What else? Uh, anyone else? Thank you. It's the place of sacrifice and worship. Thank you, Asha, for sharing that. Someone was saying something. Can I say something, sir? Sure. God, for the first time, wanted to dwell among his... He wanted to know them, that he wanted to dwell with them, mm -hmm. with the people of Israel. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. You wanted to... Dwell with them for the first time. Okay, come on, guys. Oh, what else? I mean, whatever you've heard or know about the tabernacle of Moses, anything? Anyone? No one. <laughs> Right. Um, okay, I'm still waiting. Anyone? I thought I heard someone. Yeah. Testimony and communion, says Asha. Yeah. Okay. Sir, one more thing. Not only the is not only Moses and priests. Everyone had access to approach God. In that tabernacle, according to uh, Exodus 33, we see where they all come out of the tents when they saw Moses going towards that tabernacle, the tent where he, he met God. Hmm. So everyone had right. an access. That is a great thing. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you. Abhishek says, once a year, high priest went into the Holy of Holies with the blood of the Lamb. Can yeah. I say something first? Yes, Charles, yeah. Can I add some? Yeah, uh, you observe that 
though it is not recorded that these people were singing and were doing the worship we are seeing today, but you would see the order, you would, even the, 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 that part that contained the food, the contained the furniture, the mm. order, you would find that everything was orderly. So mm. even when we come to the New Testament where they say we are serving a God of order, so right. I am seeing worship as something that would be orderly. Yeah, thank you, Charles. Yeah, order. Yeah, everything was in order. Yeah. Obedience and intimacy. Yeah. Forget for the forgiveness of sins of Messiah. Yeah, obedience and intimacy. Yeah, anything else? Christopher, anything? Um, Shri, come on. Whatever. Yeah, to prove his uh, love and faithfulness, and um, as everyone said, uh, the intimacy, I believe, and um, also, um, I believe that um, uh, he wants, he also said in the book of, um, um, in the Exodus and um, in the Deuteronomy that uh, when you follow me, you will be the wisest people on the planet Earth. So I believe mm -hmm. that um, uh, God just not uh want us to uh you know to uh, to to have just a fellowship but mm -hmm. because of that fellowship god wants us to be a very peculiar kind of a people on the planet earth like a very yeah. you know god wants us to uh, display his glory through us that's something I agree. thank you yeah Pastor. yeah thank you Shri Kumar. Yeah. yeah uh i like the interesting choice of words to display his love and faithfulness um yeah okay uh so uh, let's just uh, I, I want to start the tabernacle actually from um, let's go to Genesis chapter 3 okay uh, let's go to Genesis chapter 3 was so close in reach of the, thank you uh, Genesis chapter 3 verse 8 um, you know, I want to start the tabernacle from here. Um, Genesis chapter 3, verse 8. It says, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Uh, by now we know what has happened, right? They heard the Lord as he was walking in the, in the garden in the cool of the day. They hid from the Lord God among the trees of the God garden. In verse 10, uh, he answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. So I hid. They hid from the Lord uh, for the first time for the first time in their history uh, from fellowship and communion because of sin they hid from the Lord for the first time there is a disconnect like a dislocated shoulder uh, you know sin separated right uh, sin separated uh, them from God right um, and so from there on about from somewhere from this time till about somewhere in exodus chapter 25 exodus chapter 25 uh, there was no abiding place for god there was no resting place and uh, so the historians and the scholars say it's the time span is about 2500 years 2500 years from the time of Adam from the time of fall and somewhere in Exodus 25 uh, for about 2500 years you would now and then between those in that gap you would see a lot of characters I mean you can think of a lot of characters and stories that has happened right taking place uh, from uh, Noah Abraham and uh, Isaac Jacob uh, Joseph uh, as well um, and that's when we come so a lot has happened and now and then you would see, okay, uh, there would be visitations, right? God would visit the people, but there was no resting place. Uh, that's what sin had done. Is sin basically it separates us, 
right? In Ephesians chapter 2, we see that we were separated, we were dead in sin. Uh, it says, the, the Bible says, right? Um, and so, as soon as sin entered, uh, our spirit man was separated from the, uh, God's spirit, right? As in, we, we were set apart, uh, we were separated. And there was a disconnect that happened. Um, and that's why, we're, so when we, when we die, what happens is like, uh, our spirit is separated from our body, isn't it? Um, and and when we read John chapter three verse sixteen, uh, the famous verse everybody knows, uh, you know, whoever believes shall not perish but have eternal life. Right now, eternal life is not uh, it's not the longevity of it, but it's. I am reconnect. My spirit is reconnected with the spirit of God when I have accept accepted Him as my Lord and Savior. Because regardless of after your physical death, you are going to continue to exist either in hell or in heaven. We, we, so eternal life is not about the longevity of your existence. You're going to continue to exist in either of the places, but it's about your spirit being reunited with the spirit of God. And but. Originally, that's exactly what happened in Genesis chapter 3, is that our spirit, we were separated, we hid ourselves. That's what sin makes us want to do. And for the longest time, uh, the humanity didn't feel like, you know, felt like they were doing okay without his presence, being separated from him, being without a dwelling place and whatnot. And finally, after everything that happens in the book of Exodus, when we come to chapter 25, uh, then we see, uh, and, and, and when you read chapter 24, you see by then, uh, Israelites had uh, already kind of made a golden calf for themselves. They've broken the command, first commandment uh, and whatnot. Um, it says here in Exodus chapter 25, I just want to read uh, from verse 1 um till verse 22 so so a lot of reading okay i hope you're okay with that are you ready guys yeah i hope you have your bibles with you yeah give me a thumbs up or uh <laughs> yeah okay so exodus chapter 25 verse 1 says the lord said to moses tell the israelites to bring me an offering you are to receive the offering for me from each man whose heart prompts him to give. These are the offerings you are to receive from them. Gold, silver and bronze. Blue, purple and scarlet yarn and fine linen. Goat hair ram skins dyed red and hides of sea cows acacia wood olive oil for the light spices for the anointing oil and the fragrant for the fragrant incense and onyx stones and other gems to be mounted on the ephod and breast piece then have them make a sanctuary for me and i will dwell among them Make this tabernacle and all its furnishings exactly like the pattern I will show you. Okay, so quick pause there. Um, so once they give everything that I've asked them to give, uh, another no, uh, here God is making the same people who gave their precious jewels, gold and whatnot, to build that golden calf. He's making them give as well. Okay, you invested something into some uh, into something false now i want you to reinvest into something that is true okay and have them make a sanctuary for me the same people who made built that golden car now i want them to make a sanctuary for me okay sanctuary a holy place uh, we get the word uh, sanctuary from the greek word a latin word actually sanctus sanctus it means holy right sanctuary uh, a dwelling place in other words okay uh, a dwelling place tabernacle they are used interchangeably so it simply means the same um, 
but we'll see much later the significance of the choice of words there. Okay, uh, so verse 10 onwards, have them make the chest of acacia wood two and a half cubits long and a cubit and a half wide and a cubit and a half high overlaid with pure gold with both inside and out and make gold molding around it. Cast four gold rings for it and fasten them to its four feet with two rings on one side and two rings on the other. Then make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. Insert the poles into the ring on the sides of the chest to carry it. The poles are to remain in the rings of this ark. They are not to be removed. Then put the ark of the testimony which I will give you. Make an atonement cover, which is a mercy seat, of pure gold, two and a half cubits long, and a cubit and a half wide, and make two cherubims. Okay, uh, just to fast move fast forward. Okay, verse twenty-two. Let's come down to verse twenty-two. Verse twenty-one. Place the cover on top of the ark and put in the ark the testimony which I will give you. There. Above the cover, between the two cherubim that are over the ark of the testimony, I will meet with you and give you all my commands for the Israelites. Okay, I will meet uh, with you. That's exactly what the tabernacle was. It was a meeting place for the first time in about 2,500 years. There is a bridge between heaven and earth where divinity is meeting, you know, a humanity. Okay, where this, like, the, there are two worlds colliding uh, and that's, and you can imagine the beauty of that place and how significant, how awesome it would be. Uh, now, finally, God has a resting place, a dwelling place. Okay. Um, so, uh, in your notes, when we see in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1, 2, and 5, I'm just looking at the PDF in page 16. Uh, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1, 2, and 5, it says, Now, this is the main point of the things we are saying we have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens a minister of the sanctuary and of the ta true tabernacle which the lord erected and not man who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, see that you will make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. Okay, so the instruction that God gave Moses uh, was a shadow of something that was already erected by God in the heavens, right? So it's a, it's a blueprint, uh, so to speak, right? So um, in Revelation eleven nineteen it says, then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of His covenant was seen in His temple, um, right? So therefore, the earthly tabernacle will teach us something about the true heavenly tabernacle. So that's one of the reasons why we are learning about this thing is, uh, you know, the question says, why are we learning about the tabernacle of Moses? It's in the old covenant. Uh, what's, the, what's the need for it? What's the, you know, uh, we are in the new covenant. There is no outer courts, inner courts. Uh, you know, we don't need all of that. Uh, but I think it's just the importance of it is the, God showed Moses what already exists. Uh, and when you read those scriptures, uh, it says, Who serve the copy and the shadow of the heavenly things as Moses was divinely instructed, right? a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. Um, right, so that's one of the reasons. So we now we have like a, a, an understanding of why we needed the tabernacle. Uh, because of sin, there was no real connection between humanity and divinity. Uh, God would just God would show up. There would be uh, visitations, uh, but there was no abiding place. There was no resting place, uh, like how it was in the garden. That there there was there was communion. There was fellowship. They were they were as one. 
but sin separated us. Uh, that was the price of sin. Yes, Shri Kumar. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah. Pastor, uh, I just want to know, as you said, um, uh, the tabernacle is a meeting meeting place yes. uh, where the where the God meets uh, the people. So yes. now, uh, as you as you shared me this uh, uh, Revelation eleven nineteen, yeah. that the, in the, that isn't the same thing is in the heaven. There's there's ark is at the temp, uh, in the heaven. Yeah. So I just want to know that uh, why the ark of covenant is in the heaven when yeah. we are directly meeting God there. The ark why the ark of covenant is needed there. So that's my question. Like like in the on the earth we know that we cannot able to meet him because of our sin. Uh, but in the heaven, anyway, we are with him. Right. So do, do we need the Ark of Covenant? Yet? I just want to know that the, why it is the Ark of Covenant God showed to most, uh, sorry, John there in the book of Revelation. Thank you. Yeah, so yeah, you, you, you're welcome. Um, so if you go to Revelation, uh, Revelation chapter 11, now, um, see, uh, the Ark of the Covenant represented the uh, the presence of God, uh, the glory of God, uh, ma manifest presence, because that's where uh, his, it was his throne on earth. Right? So when we look at Revelation chapter 11, um, okay. I want to just read from uh, verse 15, 11, 15. It says, The angel sounded his trumpet, and there was loud voices in heaven, which said, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders was, who were seated on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thanks to the Lord, to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who is, who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. Okay, it's talking about a different reign uh, here. The nations were angry and your wrath has come. The time has, the time has come for judging the dead and for rewarding your servants, the prophets, and your saints, and those who reverence your name, both small and great, and for destroying those who destroyed the earth. So, so it's talking about a, a judgment day there, right? The time has come. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and within his temple was seen the ark of his covenant. Okay, and there came flashes of lightning, rumbling peals of thunder, and the and the earthquake and a great hail storm. Okay, so once again. Verse 19, that then God's temple in heaven was opened. And within his temple was seen the ark of his covenant. Now, uh, a lot of things in the book of Revelation is also uh, or metaphoric, uh, symbolic, uh, and imagery that's being used, right? So as I was saying, that the ark of the covenant here um, in the tabernacle on earth was represented um, his throne. Right, his presence. So every time Israel went for war, uh, for battle and whatnot, uh, the the Levites would carry the Ark of the Covenant and go before them. That show that the God that their God is with them, right? And so this basically simply means that uh, God is in His temple, uh, as in the images we see as was seen the Ark of His Covenant. Within his temple was in the Ark of his Covenant. It's simply, uh, I mean, it is the way I'm looking at it is uh, it is his manifest presence. It is him who is there and it is him, uh, you know, who's reigning from his uh, temple. So that's the way I am looking at it because, uh, and when you read, and why I'm saying that it is him is because when you read John chapter 1, Right. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and Word was with God, and Word was, was God. And if you come down to uh, verse 14, um, just very quickly, bear with me. Um, uh, 14, the Word became uh, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling. That means he dwelt among us. He tabernacled among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Okay, so uh, the tabernacle, Jesus in the New Testament is what tabernacle was in the Old Testament. So he is the tabernacle, uh, you know, and he also goes on to say that among you is the one who stands 
a one who's greater than the tabernacle, uh, right? So uh, the Ark of the Covenant, it just comes down to that. It's the imagery of God himself being present. Uh, and like you said, that uh, we are going to be with him. And so, yeah, that's exactly, that's what it means, at least for me. But then if there's anything else that anybody wants to add to it, uh, feel free to. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Yeah. There, is there anything else anybody wants to add to that? Uh... Sir, shall I just read what is uh, given by David uh, Guzik in that the Ark of the Covenant? Can you hear me, sir? Yes. Yes. The Ark of the Covenant is the symbol of God's faithfulness in bestowing grace on his people and inflicting vengeance on his people's enemies. It is called the Ark of His Covenant in the Old Testament. This was the earthly representation of God's throne to emphasize God's faithfulness. Yeah. The Ark refers to God's throne, the place where the previously mentioned resolution will come from. I, uh, In my understanding, I think God's covenant, which he made with man, stands forever. Even yeah. we can see it in eternity also, and it is yeah. so um, gives us so much faith and strength. Yeah, re remembering his faithfulness. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I think it's interesting. Like uh, also initially, as what uh, I think, yeah, Shri Kumar itself shared, it was a display of his love and faithfulness, uh, and one of his. Uh, I mean, he is the God who keeps the covenant, and that's you know that means uh, he keeps he's faithful to what he says. He's faithful to who he is, because uh, that's who he is. And I'm just reminded of this verse in Psalm 85, verse 10, like about the tabernacle, uh, as in Psalm 85, verse 10. I think if I'm right, my memory serves me right. Um, verse 10. Yeah, love and faithfulness meet together, righteousness and peace, they kiss each other. Faithfulness springs forth from the earth and righteousness looks down from heaven. Uh, the Lord the Lord will indeed give what is good and our land will yield its harvest. Righteousness goes before him and prepares the way for his steps. But just that verse 10, love and faithfulness meet together, righteousness and peace, they kiss each other. It's just a beautiful imagery of what is happening in the meeting place and what happened in John chapter 1 verse uh, 14. Right, he dwelt in the tabernacle amongst us. Right. Um, yeah. So thanks, Rupa. Thanks, Shri Kumar, for the question. Um, so for us to move on, um, so we, we see the description uh, of the tabernacle and we, we kind of know how it was uh, you know um, erected and whatnot. But um, so just to begin. <clears throat> Every time we mention about the tabernacle, we start off with uh, the outer courts, inner courts, and the uh, holy of holies, so the most holy place, as we say it, right? Uh, but uh, we miss out one of the most, a very significant part of the tabernacle is uh, the gate, right? Um, so uh, let me just see if I can share the screen um, or some of the pictures. Uh, Sure, we've already seen it. But these are all images just from uh, Google. All right, so you, you have uh, the outer courts, and you ha in the outer courts, you have two pieces of furniture, which is uh, the brazen altar. The brazen laver. Okay, so this is where the uh, the animals were sacrificed. Uh, bronze uh, altar, and this is bronze laver. Inside, it's like a tub that was uh, filled with water. Inside it, it was filled with. Uh, it was made of mirrors. Okay, so like I said, guys, we're not going to go into the details of how it was made and all of that. Okay, but uh, and then you have the uh, inner courts. Um, so it's separated by a veil and when you go in uh, there's the table of showbread and uh, the golden lampstand and uh, uh, what's that the altar of incense 
right? And before that, uh, and after the altar of incense, there was uh, there's another veil that separated the um, the inner courts from the most holy place or the holy of holies. Okay, and this cloud represented uh, the glory of God present, the, His manifest presence, and and how many times in the Old Testament we time and time again see that. Uh, his glory, he manifested himself in the form of a cloud, you know, when the priests worshipped and sang, like, he, the cloud filled the temple. We, we read that last week, right? Uh, let's see if I can get another image. Okay. This is just another image because I thought it was. Uh, it's pretty cool to see. Right. It's a wonderful imagination. Um, I'm sure it's not exactly how it looked. Right? Okay, so uh, it's just a wonderful imagination of people. Um, hey, Pastor Pin, um, awesome, isn't it? Uh, you see, like there are all these tribes around the tabernacle, right? Uh, and you see this tabernacle the uh, with the white uh, tent kind of a thing. But, and everybody in the camp of Israel knew that God was present, that he wanted them to know that he was holy from every side. And, and then when, and suddenly, there seemed to be only one way to enter. They couldn't enter from which, uh, you know, any side they wanted to, you know. But there was only one way to enter in. Okay. Um, let me stop sharing that. Uh, Charles, you have a question? So not a question faster, but um, I'm, I'm seeing that every time, every time uh, worship would be done properly in the way he wanted it, God would come. Mm -hmm. And the, in your last statement, you said that it appears that it was only the one way they entered. So exactly, hmm, it brings yes. us. To Jesus Christ, that he is the only one way whom we yeah. shall worship in the truth. Yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Uh, just one last image, and I'll pause here as we continue. Um, so, another imagination uh, of the gate. Um, okay, so. Uh, I, I, let's. I, I want to call this uh, as a place of introduction. Okay, uh, we every time we talk about the tabernacle, we directly just talk about the outer courts, inner courts, and the holy of holies. But and leave out the gate. Uh, it's crucial. It's uh, very very crucial. Uh, right. Uh, Psalm hundred verse four. It says, "Enter his gates with thanksgiving and praise." Right? Thanks is related to God's goodness. We thank and we praise Him uh, for who He is and what He has done for us. Uh, you know, it is at the gate we have a revelation of who Jesus is, um, and and He says in John fourteen six that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Me. John ten nine says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come out and go out and find pasture. Right? Uh, so it's beautiful significance, uh, very symbolic. Uh, and as you can see, the, the gates were made of four different colors. Uh, and initially, when we read from Exodus chapter 25, we see that God telling uh Telling them to bring very specific gifts, isn't it? He's, he didn't say that, okay, just go ahead and uh, give me whatever you feel like giving uh, and make the sanctuary the way you want to build it uh, with any color or with anything that you see it fit. 
and whatnot. So he was very specific. He was a very clear as like, okay, bring me gold, bring me silver, bring me bronze, uh, blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and fine linen, goat hair, and skin dyed red, and hides of sea cows, acacia wood, uh, so detailed. Uh, it's, uh, it's like, you know, talk about uh, a person, you know, who knows what they want. <laughs> Like God clearly knew, uh, you know, what he wanted and what he wanted them to bring, um, right? So as you can see, the gate was made of four colors, uh, and very, very quickly, uh, you know, you can study about colors uh, as in the biblical uh, meaning behind it. It's it's an it's a broader study of uh, biblical hermeneutics because uh, hermeneutics is yeah you you study about the text uh, you know the different forms of communication right so there's uh, but symbolism is just another form of uh, hermeneutics in a way uh, a non-verbal communications uh, and god seems to use that time and time again we see that in in the language of the bible all the time isn't it uh, like we call jesus as the lamb of god uh, you know, the lamb that was crucified. Um, so that doesn't mean, Je you know, Jesus became like a sheep. Or, uh, you know, it's it's uh, it's a symbol, isn't it? And every time you see a rainbow, God uses rainbow. Say, hey, that's a symbol. That means I'm covenant keeping God, and you will remember my faithfulness, my goodness, uh, and and whatnot. So uh, when you can, I'm not going to turn this class into a studying the colors kind of a class and whatnot. But I would encourage you to. Uh, when you find the time to study about the biblical meaning uh, interpretation of the colors and how God used that. But so here we see that uh, the gate is made up of four different colors, blue, purple, scarlet, uh, and fine twine linen. Uh, so blue represents heavenly things, uh, the divinity. Uh, in Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 26, Ezekiel 1, verse 26, uh, it says, uh, and above the firmament, uh, over their heads was like was the likeness of a throne in appearance like a sapphire stone on the likeness of the throne was a likeness with the appearance of a man high above it okay the sapphire stone uh, another scripture is exodus 24 verse 10 it says and they saw the god of israel there was under his feet as it were a payment of sapphire stone Okay, like the very heaven of clearness. So, uh, blue represents like divinity, divinity, heavenly things. Uh, purple is a color of royalty. You know that. Uh, it all these uh, white, scarlet is the color of blood, red, uh, and white is pure, you know, uh, perfection uh, without spot and blemish. It's another symbol, right? Uh, so you understand the symbols, right? I mean, in modern day, you know, uh, what some couples, uh, when they have to reveal the gender of the kids, uh, at least not in India, uh, abroad, you know, I think blue stands for a boy, and pink stands for a girl, I think. <laughs> Might be wrong, okay. Uh, <laughs> but, yes, yeah. yes. Okay. Um, so that's the thing. Okay, when you say purple was a color, is a color of royalty. Uh, you, you don't see any kings coming up with a pink robe and stuff like that. Everybody comes has a purple uh, robe and whatnot. Uh, some of the you know, historians, scholars uh, refer to these uh, colors, four colors of the gates, to the four gospels, uh, and rightly so, because in the book of uh, Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, we see uh, Jesus is presented. Uh, as the king of the Jews, uh, right? Purple and and in Luke we see that he is uh, the friend of sinners, a suffering and a dying uh, king. And Mark we see that he is a perfect and a sinless uh, man. And in, in John we see that he is a son of God, which represents Louis, uh you know, divinity. Um, so at the gate we are introduced uh, to Jesus uh, you know we encounter him uh, and sometimes what happens is it is possible for us to just to get to know him and give him our life and go back and not go deeper so this whole journey of the tabernacle is uh, is just going deeper into a level of intimacy in knowing uh, our king right so I think it's
stop this uh, sharing. And so after the gate, we are introduced to the outer court. Uh, and in the outer court, uh, we know there are two uh, pieces of furniture. One is the brazen altar. Uh, it says in Exodus 27, verse 1 and 2, You shall make an altar of acacia wood, five cubits long and five cubits wide. The altar shall be square and its height shall be three cubits. You shall make its horns on its four corners. Its horns shall be of one piece with it and you shall overlay it with bronze. Okay, so this altar. Or the brazen altar uh, was the altar of sacrifice, right? It was um, when someone had committed a sin and whatnot, they would, you know, the, the procedure or the process was that they would come and bring a spotless lamb uh, who will take uh, their place on the altar. Okay, and uh, it's, it's not like, okay, they would come, this give this lamb, sacrificial lamb, and then they go away. So they will have to stand there uh, once it's bled. They will have to watch, uh, you know, that until the sacrifice is done, because it reminds them that I should should have been them on the altar, but an innocent lamb is taking their place. Uh, so the altar is a place of sacrifice. It is uh, the place of surrender, uh, and then it's also a sim sim uh, symbolic of the cross. But Jesus is our ultimate sacrifice, where he laid down, uh, he, you know, he surrendered himself to the will of his Father, uh, right? And then it doesn't stop there. We are called, uh, in, as we read in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, we are called to live our life, to offer ourselves as living sacrifices. Pick up our cross just as Jesus did. And so... This is a, it's symbolic of the cross. And it's it's where reconciliation happens, right? At the gate, we are introduced uh, to Jesus of who He is. We encounter Him, and then we encounter Him at the cross uh, as well. You know, it's a place of reconciliation where we know that we are reconciled uh, with the Father, right? Uh, Hebrews chapter thirteen, verse fifteen and sixteen, at the bottom of page seventeen, says, "Therefore." By him, let us continually offer the sacrifices of praise to God. Uh, that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But do not forget to do good and to share. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Okay, most of the time we stop at this. Okay, a praise to God, that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Full stop. We stop there. Uh, but what continues, uh, which is also uh, you know, acknowledged as worship is, but do not forget to do good and to share. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Uh, right. So one of the things about sacrifice, which we've learned in the first year, is, is not just giving up but, uh, something, but it's also taking on something. Right, so most of the times when we say sacrifice is, oh, I'm giving up something. I'm sacrificing this so I can do this. You know, I'm sacrificing uh, my time of just playing football with my friends so I can uh, be with my family. You get an exa an idea, right? So what a sacrifice is, but it also it's not just about giving up something, but it also means taking on something. Uh, when it says do good. Um, when someone wants to, uh, you know, like go, with, they want you to go with them for a mile. You go for an extra mile with them. You don't have to, but then you do. You take on, you take it on, right? So that is also uh, a sacrifice, as well, which uh, we are encouraged to do. So, the altar, the brazen altar, is a place of uh, reconciliation. It's uh, where we meet Jesus at the cross, and we are encouraged. Uh, to uh, to offer up us uh, our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, right? So, and then uh, okay, so I think we're out of time. Right, I'll pause here and uh, we'll resume after the break, the second session. All right. So, you guys have a, a good break, and I'll see you in ten minutes.